Okay. Okay, yes, so thanks for the introduction and it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss today about astrophysical interpretation of neutrinos observed by Ice Cube in the last years. So uh, just starting with some historical things, here the importance of looking at cosmic neutrinos. We are talking about, this, those are two different uh, proceedings that was doing by uh, Frederick Reines and Grayson in the 60s. So at that time it was the first idea that neutrinos are important not only for as a as a study of the particle or the physics of the particle, but also about uh, the interpretation and the messenger of astrophysical uh, sources. So they start to speak here about uh, cosmics and cosmic ray neutrino. Cosmic ray neutrino they 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 were referring to atmospheric neutrino, and they say that. At that time, the probably neutrino will become an important messenger in the astrophysics, and they say that probably it will involve also astronomy, but we were at the 60s. So here are the first, uh, the first detection of uh, extraterrestrial neutrino. So we have uh, with Raymond Davis the detection of uh, neutrino uh, signal uh, from the sun. So we had the neutrino low energy neutrino detected and that, that will with this detection he get he got the Nobel Prize. And also the detection from a supernova uh, one one thousand nine hundred eighteen seven A from uh, Masatoshi Koshiba, it was another Nobel Prize. So the first the, the, those those are the first extraterrestrial neutrino detection that we had in the history of uh, neutrino uh, astrophysics. So here in this plot you can see the different range that where it is important to look at neutrino. And we can see here that here we have a cosmological neutrino. So we have the background of neutrino that was created just a few seconds after the Big Bang. And here we are not at the moment a uh, data taking detector. It's not easy. At the MIT, the people are thinking now how to build a detector that can look at this kind of neutrino. We have also detection of low energy neutrino, solar and supernova with the underground detector. And then we have the very high energy neutrino that we will explore here in this talk that we had uh, generally with Cherenkov detector, so deep water and deep ice. And then we have ultra energy neutrino in this range of energy that can be detected with acoustic in the water and also with radio in the, in the atmosphere. So we also here are in the development some detector for this kind of range of energy. Some word about the production of neutrino in the astrophysical sources. Generally, we have an accelerator, and then uh, the accelerated cosmic rays and proton. In this case, they reach a target. So we have a material can be photons or can be nuclear. So generally, thermal particle that are around the sources. And then we have a production through PP and P gamma interaction of pi zero, pi plus, and pi minus. And, uh, and then from pi zero, we obtain uh, gamma ray uh, emission. And from pi plus and pi minus, we have this channel, this decay channel, and we produce the, the two family of neutrino, nu mu and nu e. And then they can oscillate in the, in the, in the, in the way to arrive to us. And we will observe also the three family in the head. Another important step here, also the same, the same here in the 60s, we have uh, an interesting discussion here, very didactical, from this famous guy that was at that time in the Rochester meeting, and they were discussing about the possibility to construct a Cherenkov detector <coughs> to looking at neutrino, a different range of energy. 
So some word about the detection. Generally, we have, as I said, we have a production of neutrino in the astrophysical sources. And then we have the neutrino can, can, can cross the universe. The horizon for the neutrino is, 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 very, is bigger than the other particles. We can, for ultra energy neutrino, we have an horizon about six gigaparsecs. So it's an important, a very important messenger of, of, of uh, our universe. So when neutrino arrives to the Earth, it can interact with the nucleon and then it can produce the, the, the lepton, the corresponding lepton, and then the lepton can cross the detector, and then if we are in the ice or in the water, we have a production of Cherenkov light, so we can build here an array of detectors, they can look at Cherenkov light, we can reconstruct the direction, and we can reconstruct also the energy of the, uh, the primary particle, the neutrino in this case. So we had uh, this first prototype from the 75 to the end of 90s, from Duman, Baikal, Nestor, Amanda, and Nemo, uh, with this detector, we obtain mostly the uh, measurement of uh, atmospheric muon. So we, it's important to know also atmospheric muon because it's like a background that we have when we look at the neutrino. So with this, with this fifth prototype, we obtain the, the, the <coughs> muon spectrum. And then starting the, uh, just a few years ago, with the ice cube, uh, with the, that is at the South Pole, with the more than times uh, 5,000 optical module, we obtain the first detection of astrophysical neutrino. And then with Antares, also, we obtain some upper limit. And we have also some joint observation by the two experiments. The first step of ice cube was in April 2013, the first two astrophysical TV neutrino that they, they were called Bert and Ernie. And then in November 2013, they published of 28 astrophysical neutrino, about 30 TeV with a significant of four sigma. And then May 2014, we had a new catalog of 37 astrophysical neutrino. And then last ICRC on July 2015, with the new catalog of uh, 54 astrophysical neutrino and a significance of more than five sigma, uh, seven sigma, sorry. Here we have a distribution, so here is the spectrum of detecting neutrino. You can see here in black the neutrino detected, and you can see here in the violet how should be the expected background from the atmospheric, uh, atmospheric neutrino. So you can see here how is the step that, that, uh, that was uh, important to say, okay, those kind of neutrino are not atmospheric neutrino, so they're coming from astrophysical sources. And that this was the observed spectrum. So we have this kind of flux. And uh, with, uh, the, last, uh, the last spectral index that was measured was 2.58. So this was this coming from the last catalog of 54 uh, astrophysical neutrino. Here you can see also the, the declination distribution of this neutrino. And you can see also here how bigger is the data respect to the expected background. So you are with more than seven sigma you can say that these neutrino are from astrophysical origin. Here the, the sky map of the 54 events that are distributed in the sky. Most of these events are shower events with a, with a bad angular resolution that is between 10 degree to 30 degree. And we have also, uh, between these 54, we have also 13 tract events that are mostly NUMU events, so they come in from NUMU neutrino. And uh, most of them are, you can see here, with, uh, with, the, with the crosses, that uh, the difference and the, and the plus difference <laughs> between the shower and the, and the tracks. And the tracks are very important because they have an angular resolution of one degree. So it's much uh, better to do astrophysics uh, study with this kind of events. And also here, the distribution between the three family of neutrinos, so you can see here, New Tau, New Mu, and New e, and the distribution is mostly uh, distributed homogeneously between the three families. So we have one, one, and one, and this is exactly what we expect if the origin of those neutrino are astrophysics. So some contested idea that we have up to now with uh, the observed <coughs> neutrino is how much of these astrophysical neutrinos are produced in our galaxy and how much they are coming from extragalactic uh, sources. And another important point is that 
uh, why uh, we don't see any uh, accumulation of events from a point like uh, known sources at the moment, and so how much is also the, the diffuse emission contribution in the, in the, in the catalog that we have. And we don't see, uh, as I said, we don't see any correlation with the known point-like sources at the moment. So we are waiting much more statistics to do, to do this kind of correlation. And so is, is, is really the, the signal homogeneous or, or not? That's also another important question that people are thinking about this in this moment. So in, the, so in this talk, I will explore two different scenarios for galactic emission and intergalactic emission. So for the galactic emission, we have also a better understanding of cosmic rays uh, diffusion and transport in our galaxy because the neutrinos are produced by the cosmic rays that interact with the dust in the galaxy, and then they can produce neutrino and antineutrino. And then I will assume that we have a, a subnominal emission from point-like sources because, as I said, we don't see any accumulation in the position of known sources. Uh, for extragalactic uh, emission, I will consider uh, one of the last analyses that I actually did about northern hemisphere with muonic neutrino. So we know that the center of the galaxy is in the south. We have a less contamination of galactic events in the north hemisphere. So we can, we can say that the flux that is measured for the northern hemisphere is in a good approximation of what we expect from astrophysical or uh, extragalactic origin. And so we will explore also some hints of possible candidates for this kind of event. For the galactic emission, we know from Fermi that we have also a diffuse emission. He here is the map of diffuse emission in gamma rays. And so we know that gamma rays are produced by photopion production, as I said, by cosmic rays interaction with the gas. In this case, we have uh, at the same time production of neutrino and production also of uh, gamma rays. But gamma rays can be produced also by electronic interaction, so we have also Bram Stralung, and we have also Inbert Compton. So we will analyze this kind of emission, and we'll better understand the cosmic ray transport thanks to, due to, to this kind of data. Here we see the last, uh, when we explain the cosmic ray transport, and so we should explain also how is this gamma ray emission from the galaxy. In the past, uh, uh, in the past model that was used with Galprov, we see that uh, if you look here, those are the Fermi data at high energy. So those were the model, the blue was the, the sum of electronic mass hadronic emission from uh, diffuse cosmic range transport. And you can see here the gap between the model and the data. And another problem for this kind of model of cosmic range transport was also the explication of the excess measured by Milagro a 15 TV. So you can see here that the last model that, that had a problem to fit the data of Fermi here at high energy, and also the data of Milagro at 15 TV. So in PISA, we introduced a new model that was a new model of uh, diffuse uh, cosmic ray transport in the galaxy. So we introduced a new uh, diffusion coefficient that is radially dependent. So it uh, increased when you go from the center of the galaxy to the periphery of the galaxy. And this creates a hardening of the spectrum if you look at the neutrino of gamma ray when you go through the center of the galaxy. And so introducing this model, you can see here how it changes. Now here in black, we have the sum of leptonic plus hadronic interaction from diffuse cosmic rays. And you can see here how we fit the data now. So here we have the, the difference between uh, the inner galactic plane, so inside, and this, this is also what we have for higher latitudes of the galaxy. So you can see here that the model uh, works well for uh, inner galactic plane and also for higher latitude of the galaxy. Here, another important step of this model was to fit not only the Fermi data, but also the Milagro uh, excess of 15 GV. So you can see here that we have the leptonic as a pi zero interaction, and we have also the lep leptonic as a Bram Stalling and inverse Compton. And the black here is the sum of all of these components and you can see how we can fit also the Milagro. So we solve the problem, the long-standing problem of uh, diffuse uh, transport of cosmic rays in our galaxy. And this is important because it will tell us not only how is diffuse gamma ray emission, but also how is the diffuse neutrino emission from our galaxy. Another important observational hint 
for this model was if this is the a proceeding of Fermi lab collaboration, they will publish soon also a paper on this. And you can see here as a distance, the galactocentric distance from the center of the galaxy. And you can see here the spectral index. And you, you see that this is an hardening of the spectrum when you go through the close to the center of the galaxy and uh, how the spectrum becomes soft when you go through the peripheric region. So this is another important hint that say that we have uh, really a variable diffusion coefficient in our galaxy. So the spectrum expected in the center of the galaxy is very different to the, spectre, uh, to the spectrum expected at the periphery of the galaxy. So as I said with this model, we had, we introduced this model in a, in a cluster, in a computer cluster. We had uh, this code was called a dragon. And so we, we, we simulate all the transport of the proton in the galaxy, we, we put inside the gas distribution of the galaxy. And we had, we sum all the injector that we have in the galaxy, all the supernova remnant that we know that are in our galaxy, and they are producing adronic interaction. So you can see here the map of expected neutrino at TeV. And the, the map, the, <coughs> the, the protonuclear interaction, we follow this work of Kama et al. for the gas distribution. We use the same gas distribution that's used by Galtrop uh, group and that's uh, for the Fermi benchmark model that was used in the last year. And so you can see here, this was the, the butterfly with the, those are neutrino spectrum. So here we have the spectrum of neutrino between 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 7 GeV and this was the last butterfly published last July. And this is the, the, the full sky spectrum measured with the 54 neutrino. And this is the model. This is the new model in blue with two different cutoffs for protons. So this is the, the solid one is for the cutoff of 50 TV of proton. And the, the, the dashed one is for the cutoff of proton at 5 TV. We have to do this different cutoff because we should take into account also the local measurement of cosmic rays. So here we have also the data for AMS, uh, Pamela, Cascade, and Cascade Grande. And you can see here the data of Cascade Grande have this dispersion in the spectrum. So we, we adopt these two kind of fit uh, with, this, with the cutoff of 50 TV and with the cutoff of 5 TV. So using these two cutoff, we obtain these two neutrino spectrum for the old sky. And this was the old Galtrop model. And you can see here the difference between the new model and the, la and the, the old one. How we reach much more neutrino for the diffuse emission of our galaxy. And this is the gap that we have between the model and the spectrum measured by ICE. So we can say that all these gaps can be account with uh, uh, extragalactic sources. Here, it was another important uh, study that was done by Marcus Allers and the, the group of Madison. So here we have the, uh, this is the best fit of astrophysical neutrino measured by ice cube for the full, here for the full sky and here for the galactic plane. And so with Galtrop they reach a, a percentage, they, they can account for a percentage of this, this flux that is between four to eight percent. So the difference between the old model and the new model that we arrive to 20% with the new diffusion model of cosmic rays in our galaxy. So we decrease the number of expected neutrino from, the, from our galaxy. And here you can see the difference also with our model for the, for the inner part of the galaxy. In this case, we have uh, an L minus the, uh, uh, less than 30 degree and a, a B less than 7.5. And in this case, we took all the galactic plane. So in this case, the inner part of the galaxy, in this case, the, in the, the, the old galactic plane. So here, the new model as, as before, and here the old one in red. So you can see here that this is important because in this case, in green, you have atmospheric neutrino, and you can see with the new model, you can go above the atmospheric neutrino in a range of energy that is around 25 TeV. So with the old model, it's is, is pretty impossible to, to look at the uh, diffuse uh, galactic neutrino emission. With the new model, we expect to see them with, uh, with, uh, with the statistics that we have up to now, actually. 
So another important study that was done for galactic emission was this, this, uh, this study that was done by Nerot, Nernot et al. And they do the template of uh, galactic uh, gamma ray emission and from them they obtain the template of neutrino emission. And you can see here that if this in black you have the distribution of neutrino as a function of d, so the galactic longitude. And you can see here the difference if you have an isotropic one, you expect this this uh, uh, this black uh, gray uh, line. And you can see how it differs between an isotropic distribution and the real distribution. So also in this in this paper and in this work they said that. We, we have in reality uh, a not uh, subdominant component of the galactic diffuse neutrino in the, in the events measured by Geisky. So here, an important analysis that was done for the galactic ridge. So also here, we are looking at the theta minus than uh, four uh, degree and, uh, and, uh, and the, the longitude is uh, L minus than 30 degree. And uh, so we are looking at the ridge with, uh, and we're comparing the data, those are the events measured by ice cube. So in this case, we put here the 37 events of the CL catalog. And here we put the, the, the simulation that we obtained with Dragon uh, with the new diffusion emission from the, from the galaxy. And you can see here, this was the spectrum of the new model for the galactic diffusion neutrino. It was the old model. And those are the spectral points obtained with the ice cube data, so for with the catalog of 37 events. So we have only three events in the ridge, and you with these three events, we obtain these three spectral points. And you can see how the model he, he arrived to fit uh, the lower energy part of the spectrum. So in this case, of course, for the ridge, we have a dominant component of the galactic emission. In this case, we are looking exactly at the center of the galaxy. So we are much more galactic neutrino in this part than extra galactic neutrino. And this is how it works the new model explaining this data. Here, an important thing is that for looking at this, this part of the, of the sky, it's important to use also a Mediterranean observatory because for ice cube, this part of the galaxy is above the horizon. So they have much more shower events from the part of the sky Instead, if you are in the Mediterranean uh, Sea, you have much more track events because the, the region is, uh, is below the horizon for Mediterranean Observatory. So for Antares, the problem is the dimension at the moment because the dimension is, is, is too, too small with respect to, to ice cube. But you can see here the effective area that is pretty comparable uh, below uh, 100 TeV. So if you are looking below 100 TV, you can see that the, the, the effective area is pretty comparable. Uh, so we have, we have here in the black line the Antares effective area and the three effective area for ice cube for the three families. And also you can see here the sensitivity. You have ice cube sensitivity here in red and you have a blue sensitivity here for Antares. And he, if you are looking at this part of the sky, we can have a uh, joint analysis because the sensitivity is pretty comparable. This is what we will reach with the new Kentin observatory with that we are building now in the Mediterranean also at the moment. So this was an analysis that was done with the, with the, that I, I coordinate with Antares, uh, with Antares data. So we, we obtained also an analysis of the reach of the inner part of the galaxy with the data of Antares. We obtained the background from the three different slides on the sky so we go about the, above the Fermi bubble in, in, uh, in order to don't have the contamination from Fermi bubble on the background estimation. And uh, we look from the data between 2007 and 2013 with Antares data. And, and actually for this part of the sky, we don't observe any excess with respect to the measured background. But it was important because it was uh, enough to set a good upper limit for this region of the sky. So. Looking at this upper limit, this was the upper limit measured with the uh, Antares data. And he have also here the two models for diffuse galactic emission. And you can see here that uh, still uh, the, the, the model is, uh, is below the upper limit. And here also we have the, the spectral point obtained with ice cube data. And here is the sensitivity that we will obtain with the same, this is for 1,500 day of data taking. 
this is the sensitivity that we will obtain with the same uh, amount of day uh, of uh, with the new KMT and detector in the uh, Mediterranean uh, Sea. For the galactic, for the galactic emission, we have also some discussion about uh, the point-like emission. So here is the was the, the last uh, Pevatron is was the last uh, one of the last uh, is a, is an echo actually. It was uh, published by the S collaboration. So they observe a diffuse emission of gamma rays in this Pacman. This is a region that is around the Sagittarius C. And so we have a, a spectrum that, that continues possibly up to TV. Here the last point is a 30, P, a 30 TV. So we have uh, possibly the, the first pevatron uh, emitters observed in, in our galaxy. And so you can see here, this is a spectrum of a supernova remnant that is close to this region. And you can see here the new spectrum. This flux is measured by uh, ten, ten uh, is, is, is multiplied by 10, so it's is, is just to, to see the difference between these two spectrums. But you can see here that in the new spectrum you can observe uh, a, a really a clear cutoff, so it should be something different. And also here, the distribution, the density, uh, the density of cosmic rays, the density distribution of cosmic rays at a distance of the center of the galaxy, you can see here that the density distribution is too high, so probably we have an injector that is, is, it could be Sagittarius A, supernova remnant, or something more that is not observed that, that really uh, can accelerate proton up to PV energy. So this is with the S. So S uh, have a good angular resolution ac actually for points like this. This whole region is, you can see here this is less than one degree. So here is 0 0.8 degree. And so and here you are also less than one degree also in the longitude. So all, all the, the region is less than one square degree in the sky. Ah, it's, two, it's uh, around 200 parsecs. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just have a comparison between the, the emission that me was measured by Hess and the, and the model, because with the model we can fit also this part of the galaxy. And so you can see here that the old spectrum was fitted with, uh, with, uh, with the model very well, but the new spectrum, you can see here the black line is, a, is the sum of leptonic plus, plus hadronic interaction. You can see that we have also here this gap. So there should be something that is not only the diffuse emission. In this new pevatron, if we, 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 we look at the gamma ray emission, we should have some additional component that we are looking now. And we are looking also about neutrino. Actually, we, we, are, we are preparing now a big task force with also Nisim here in the Institute about study of neutrino emission from the galaxy. And so here you can see, here it was the, the spectrum obtained uh, for neutrino with the, with the pevatron that was, that was measured by S. And here we have a convolution of this kind of spectrum of neutrino with the effective area of ice cubes for the same region of the sky. So in this case, e e uh, consider that we are looking at the center of the galaxy. This is the red one that is between minus 30 to zero of uh, uh, equatorial coordination, coordinate. So you can see here that events for different, uh, uh, the, the different low energy integration, and you can see here the number of events for different cutoffs. And so the most optimistic one with the cutoff of 100 TV and the integration above 1 TV were 0.47 events with uh, four year of ice cube detection. So actually we have one neutrino event that is a PV that is compatible with this region of the sky. So if we want to, uh, if we want to account for this, this, this one event, we should find something additional. Probably the region of emission is bigger than what has measured or probably uh, we have some additional component that is not taken into account here. So, but we are looking now at the possibility. So for the galactic consideration of neutrino, we have a forest of publication, actually mo much more than this. And uh, it is important that now to say that now we are doing a, a combined ice cube and Antares uh, uh, campaign for looking at the different uh, longitude of galactic plane. So we will obtain probably very soon uh, a spectral distribution of neutrino for different regions of the galactic plane. So that will tell us much more about the 
cosmic ray transfer and about also the point like sources that we have in our galaxy. For the uh, estimating the intergalactic contribution here, we have, as I said at the beginning, we, we are looking at the, the neutrino, mu, uh, the muonic neutrino uh, analysis that was done for the northern hemisphere with the ice cube beta. So you can see here that the is in the in the space the phase space of parameters. So we have a, a best fit uh, of uh, the best fit uh, analysis of data that was pointing at 2.2 for the spectral index, and this was the uh, uh, the normalization of the flux. So we can uh, we can say that for extragalactic contribution of neutrino measured by ice cube, probably we have a best fit analysis with a spectral index that is pointing at 2.2. So this is important to remind the, the, this number because I, I will come back to this number later. So here is putting together the galactic and intergalactic emission. And you can see here for the full sky, those are the number that, those are the spectral points obtained with the ice cube analysis. These are the best fit. And so here is the galactic component obtained by the spectrum. And here we, we have the sum with the red line, you have the sum of galactic plus extragalactic. So taking the extragalactic for, from uh, analysis data, from the northern hemisphere data, and taking the galactic from the model, you can see here that the, the sum of galactic plus extragalactic exactly can fit the data. So we have uh, 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 a, good, uh, a good description of the data putting together these two, these two components. The extragalactic just taking the, the muonic neutrino from the northern hemisphere and say that from this hemisphere you have a low galactic contamination and then you take the best fit analysis from this and you, you, you account for this, this number. And here you see also that uh, also in the ridge, so in the galactic center, if you put together galactic plus extragalactic is that you reach this blue line here and you are still below the upper limit measured by Antares. Also for the galactic plane, you can see here, for the, this is for theta minus than 7.5. So here, here are the spectral points of ice cube in green. Here the galactic component still for the new model and the whole model. And if you put together the galactic component and the extragalactic, you can fit also the data for the galactic plane. Also this is uh, another important analogy that we are developing now. For the extragalactic emission, we have also a lot of uh, question now in this moment about who is the emitter of this neutrino overshadowed. And there is a lot of paper, a lot of discussion. Just here are just some example, but really it's every, every week we have a new paper about the some possible new sources or a classification of a source that could be, okay, that's, that's the major emitter. No, that's not the major emitter. Also, we have a big debate now in the community about explaining this kind of, of neutrino, especially because we know that at least 80% of these events are coming from an extragalactic origin. So the people are thinking, who are the principal emitter of this neutrino? And you can see here that we have the, the star from the TFCAT, from the TFCAT catalog, so the TV emitter in the gamma rays. And uh, you can see here the events with the, the circular region are the, the shower events from ice cube. And you can see the angular resolution is, is not giving uh, too much information. That's because we have this bad angular resolution. So to have uh, an effective uh, correlation between the position of, the, of a known sources and the position of reconstructed neutrino is impossible to do with the shower events. We, we, we need much more track events to do this. And actually is what we are expecting that we will, when we will reach a more uh, efficient statistics for the track events, we will do much more correlation with the position of known sources. Here is the new upper limit obtained. All of these points are catalog, so are TEFCAT sources. So you can see here, this was the last uh, upper limit in blue here for Antares. And this was the new upper limit that was reached, uh, putting together data of Antares with the data of ice cube, so you can see here as a function as a function of uh, of uh, longitude, you can see here the difference uh, with the old upper limit and the new upper limit. 
But on the other side, you can see here, this is the p-value, and if you go above three sigma, so in this region, you can see we have losses. So it is a minus 10, minus logarithm, uh, minus logarithm or 10 of the p-value. Uh, and you can see here that uh, we have any, uh, we have, we don't have any correlation at the moment with the known sources that are, uh, that are uh, known as a TEV emitter in the sky. Another important, uh, another important study that in my point of view will be very interesting, we are looking also with Nisima about this study, it is a study that was done by Dominguez and Aiello, and then uh, uh, they, they took uh, the uh, two FGL uh, catalogs, so the high energy catalog of Fermi, and they took, uh, they have this catalog with a lot of, uh, of, uh, of laser, of course, and some uh, and different kind of B uh, lat objects. And so you can see here, before, the, um, before considering the extragalactic background uh, light con uh, absorption, they have a spectral index that is around 2.5, but then with the, the, the absorption of ABL, they obtain a new uh, spectral index that is around 2.2. And this is very interesting because, as I told you, the northern uh, hemisphere analysis of ice cube exactly say that the best fit analysis of neutrino is 2.2. So probably these, these, these analyses are telling us that the BL lack sources are, are good candidate to explain this kind of neutrino event. We have also uh, time correlation analysis that are done with some events. In this case, it, this is an, uh, another paper that was published by Taller et al. He actually, this paper is, is now accepted by Nature. And so here we have the, you can see here with the uh, black point, the Fermi data, you can see how this is a BL lattice, PKFB 4224 and 418. And so you can see here the increasing, if you draw the light curve of these objects, and you can see here the increasing of activity uh, in this, in this, at this time. And here we have here a TV neutrino at the moment of, uh, at the middle of uh, increasing uh, activity in, in gamma ray. So the people say, okay, uh, this neutrino probably is a shower neutrino actually, and the correl and as I said before, the, the angular resolution is bad, but here we have a coloration in time and the people say okay probably this event is correlated with the increasing of activity of these sources another time correlation that we are studying now we, with new sim is also this one that is very interesting it is about mascarian floor 21 and so here you can see the light curve from fermi and you can see here the the x-ray light curve and you can see here you have an increasing uh, sorry here is fermi and here is argo and you can see here you have a flare, and you have, uh, uh, as I said, the dotted line is a neutrino event that is here. I probably they are so so. Uh, uh, okay, and and in blue you have also two events of ultra energy cosmic rays by telescope arrays, and you see that we have uh, a flare in gamma. We don't see anything in X-ray, so probably it's also an orphan flare from the lo very well known blazer, and we see also a peak in radio. So probably this is some activity that tell us there is, uh, there is uh, uh, an emission in radio. We don't see anything in it. We have uh, a very, uh, very important flare in gamma rays. Actually, is one of the, the most, uh, uh, the biggest flare in the last year of these of these sources. And you can see here the, the temporal correlation with the TA event and of and also with neutrino that we have here. So here we are speaking about days not about months as, as, as with the previous analysis. So I think this is also an interesting uh, analysis. And this is correlated with the neutrino that unfortunately is 30 TV. So we have much more probability that should be, uh, that should be from atmospheric origin, but with the time correlation, I think uh, the study will be robust enough. Here also another study that we did for the case of Paranor Riley 1N97. And here it was the, the spectrum that was measured by Fermi. And so the Fermi uh, was treated all the spectrum with the uh, electronic SST, SST emission, so self synchrotron Compton emission. And here we have also the data from Veritas, Magic, and S. And you can see here that the, the data of uh, this uh, Cherenkov telescope cannot be treated with the same uh, electronic uh, contribution, so we should have 
extra components here to, to account for this uh, kind of peptide bonds. And we did also a correlation with this trace, and we have a very bad correlation, you can see here, for Veritas, Magic, and F, and the, the X trace coming from LHCA, and you can see the bad correlation that tell us that probably we have an adronic component in this kind of emission, and so we can, we, we can account this just have this uh, an, uh, an adronic component, and so expecting that we have also neutrino emission from this, these sources. But unfortunately, even account for this uh, portion of the spectrum with an adronic origin, we are not able to see this kind of emission. You can see here with the Visa uh, Monte Carlo simulation for one kilometer cube telescope of neutrino, and you see here you have the atmospheric component here in black, Oh, the red, sorry, I, I could not see very well, it's in red. Okay, and here you have the, the blue component for proton-proton emission of neutrino, and the black component here for the proton-gamma emission of the source. So you can see here that we are completely submerged by the atmospheric component, so you cannot see this kind of signal. Even if we have a drone component from the FR FR1, like in this case for MAT7, we will not see the signal on neutrino. And this is another case that we study also in the school about the two different cases, both MA and MAT7 and MGC 1275. Even in this case, in this case is different, we take into account the proton gamma, uh, the proton uh, P gamma interaction, so the proton that accelerates the interaction with the target that are around the second peak of the SSG uh, spectrum. In this case also, we can fit uh, very well the data with electronic plus hadronic uh, emission for the these three different low luminosity AGN. But if we put the, the we integrate the spectrum of ice cube, those, those five points are the spec ice cube spectrum. In the region of observation of these objects in gamma, you can see here the spectrum of obtained is, is, uh, is too much below the the ice cube observation. So you can see here the spectrum for 10A, MAT7, and MGC, you can see. So this tells us that probably the low luminosity AGN are not the best candidate to, to explain the ice cube uh, event. In this case, another important study about the Sarbar galaxy that was, drawing by, was done by Bettel et al. And here the people say, okay, here we have a spectral index analysis with the uh, Fermi two FHL uh, catalog, and here you have uh, the, the normalization factor for the flux. And you can see here uh, how, is, how is, is this is the upper limit for non dlac uh, object to explain the spectral point of ice cube, all of this coming from ice cube, uh, two year and three year of observation. And so they say, okay, at the maximum, the objects that are not DLAC can account for this portion of the observed <coughs> spectrum. So you can see here for uh, different uh, uh, different energy, uh, for different uh, uh, different analysis, you can see considering the power law uh, spectrum or power law with the, with the cutoff, you can see here how is the gap uh, between the non BLAC sources and the observed events. So probably they say, okay, the the most of extralactic component is coming from BLAC. Another important analysis that was done about extragalactic origin of neutrino that was the follow-up of the gravitational wave that was observed by LIGO collaboration. So here we have the, the contour region of uh, a possible uh, region of the sky where the, the gravitational wave is coming. It was the gravitational wave of September 2015. And we did a, a follow-up with the ice cube data in particular with the, in the range of plus minus 500 seconds around the observed gravitational wave events. And you can see here we have three events. So those three events are, are NUMU events. So, and uh, the, the, the we have actually, no, none of these events are actually correlated spatially with the, <coughs> with the region, with the contour region of LIGO. But it's interesting at least this event because it's the only one that is a, a higher energy. So we have uh, most of the events, two of these events are, okay, here is the energy. You can see the, we have these two events that are below and around one TV. And this is the only one that is around 175 TV. So maybe this is the only interesting one. And in the, in the other way, 
That means is that uh, ice probe collects around uh, one atmospheric neutrino numu events every 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 six minutes. So if you consider the time window, so plus minus 500 seconds, one every six minutes means this means that, that those three events are uh, perfectly compatible with atmospheric events. So you cannot claim that uh, this 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 neutrino are, are related to the gravitational wave at the moment. So for extragalactic signal considerations, I, here is a summary. So the ice probe northern hemisphere can be a good approximation of the expected extragalactic uh, neutrino flux. We observed also the SR1 and 2 uh, type of objects, and we see that in general the low luminosity LGM cannot account for the, the flux that is measured by, by us, by ice probe up to now. For BLAC object and uh, flat spectrum radio quasar, we have a, a spectral index that is compatible with the northern hemisphere of ice probe analysis that was done with the four years of data. And, uh, but here we are, we are not uh, sure that, uh, that, that, that it I mean should be demonstrated that those are really the, 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 the biggest, the, 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 the most uh, plausible candidates for for uh, for account of these events, for accounting these events, so um, DRB and dark matter, I, I I I doesn't speak about DRB and dark matter in this talk, but the the claim of DRB now is less than one percent of total events observed by ice probe, so we have a very low component that uh, probably are coming from DRB. And from dark matter, we have upper limit, but of course we cannot account for this flux that we have up to now. And a very debated case is the Sarbas galaxy because we need to understand better how this kind of uh, acceleration and distortions work. And what we will do in the future is will be to apply the, the model that we have for uh, cosmic rays diffusion in our galaxy to the to case of all Sarbas galaxies. So to have a global, uh, a global uh, calculation of uh, Sarbas galaxy components on uh, neutrino emission. So this will be the next step uh, on on uh, on this topic. So let me see also some words about the new K N detector. This is the, the new optical model that was designed that was designed in uh, in, uh, in Holland. So we have one uh, we, we call a dome. It is with 31 three inch PMT that are looking through the full sky direction. And this we will do with this model. We are building two different detectors. One is in France for the measuring the mass hierarchy of neutrinos, so for the fundamental physics of neutrino, the other one, ARCA, is, will, is building now in the close to Sicily for observing two astrophysical neutrinos. So we will have in the future two different big detectors, one in the northern hemisphere and the other one in the south. So with a joint analysis, we will cover all the sky and probably we will have much more flux events. So the, the, the astrophysical interpretation will improve drastically in the next year. So here, also the first thing is already in the water, is already at the 40 miles from the coast of Sicily. And this, this is the first neutrino, atmospheric neutrino, that we reconstruct just with one line. So let me spend some word about this design. It was really a revolutionary design drawn by Mikkel's group in the Netherlands. And so with this design, we, we, we are able to reconstruct neutrino ju just with one line. So this is the, the, the design of the detector. So for the moment, the financial operation obtained the, the money just for this part of the detector, but we will reach all of this detector probably by 2020, 2022. The European community will continue to give money for this kind of experiment. So here is the difference in sensitivity. You can see here the sensitivity for Antares. You can see here in blue the sensitivity of ice group, and this is the sensitivity that, that we can reach with KMT net detector. So with the red line, this is as a function of, uh, of different uh, longitudes. You can see here how, uh, sorry, this is for declination, different declination. You can see here how will be the, di the, the, the increase in sensitivity in building this new detector. And also we increase too much the, the uh, angular resolution, not only for the track events, but also for the shower. You can see here the track analysis in blue and the shower analysis here in red. And so for the full sky coverage, we will have also uh, a good uh, shower 
uh, angular resolution, good angular resolution also for shower events. So we will, we will be able to do astrophysics not only with the packed events, but we will do astrophysics also with the shower events. This will be the new, the, new, the next step for, for uh, this kind of detection. So that's the summary and conclusion. The era of uh, astrophysics neutrino started with ice cube observation. An upper limit of 20% is set by, uh, with the new model for the galactic diffuse emission. Just few events can come from identified known galactic uh, point like sources because at the moment we don't have any accumulation related to the position of galactic point like sources. And for extragalactic, we have uh, a big debate in the community, as I said, because uh, there is a small evidence of, con of connection with BLH and flat spectrum radio quasar. We, we, we are not uh, expecting to see uh, uh, a, big, uh, 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 a big flux of neutrino from low luminosity AGN from GRB and probably with binary system as, as the one that are producing uh, gravitational waves. And the, as I said, the Starbank galaxy case is very debated at the moment. The multi-messenger approach will be very important, so electromagnetic observation, cosmic rays, will tell us much more. So some, uh, we will disentangle the also the, the production and the model of the production of neutrino in the sources if we take into account also cosmic rays and electromagnetic emission from the same sources. And as I said, uh, we will have soon the global neutrino network, what is called global neutrino network. We already have a letter of intent between these uh, telescopes, so between ice cube and ice cube neutrinos and Baikal. And so we will have an homogeneous coverture of the sky and we will reach a much better uh, angular resolution for the shower event. So that's all. Thanks. Um, so for to explain these neutrinos with the BLX and FSRQs, you require um, relativistic photons in the jet. Mm -hmm, yeah. Or there is an alternative mechanism that can have a leptonic jet, but but still produce. Um, okay, the, the, I mean the, the the common one for BLX is the, the interaction of proton in the jet with the with the photons in the jet. So you can say okay, it could be the target can be synchrotron, or can be other photons that are emitted in the jet. But of course, you can have uh, some extra uh, model that, for example, if you have an emission close to the core of the BLX, that should be related to the, the accretion disks that are uh, uh, close to the supermassive black hole. There is other model, for example, for semi-cross and narrow nodes. They, 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 they write a lot of models from the, the core of the BLX, but the most common one is the relativistic photon that are in the jet and interact with photon there. So and the time? Um expectations for the arrival times should be the same as the gamma rays? Uh, yeah, it should be not too different because uh, uh, yeah, the production uh, should be for P gamma interaction, the production should be at the same level of the jet. So yeah, we should not expect a big delay. So any delay would be local to the source? Yeah. <coughs> yep. uh, I have a very general question about the, <coughs> the detections of these neutrinos, yeah. uh, they are uh, transit or you can, uh, they are transit events or you can find them in the same place observing dif at different epochs. Ah, yeah. So it's not, I think some of them are trans transitory, they are tra transit objects. Yeah, it's difficult to say if they are transit or not because for some objects, even if they are, con if you even if you have continuous emission, you make that, you take the spectrum and you transport the spectrum of gamma and neutrino, and let's say, which is the ionic uh, component, and then you say, okay, imagine that this, uh, this source is emitting continuously for four years, is what we have up to now, four years for events, and four years is not enough to observe at one neut maximum one neutrino or one. So imagine that you observe only one neutrino from the position of the sky, you have a continuous emitter here and there, and this emitter, if you integrate the flux for the four years, you obtain maximum one neutrino. So, and uh, this, is, this is the way that at the moment it's difficult to say if there are transient events of, of, of sources that are stable. So, an important thing is, is if we have at this time correlation 
with the with the with the flare in gamma, for example, and the cosmic rays. In this case, okay, we can say that that is a, 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 a transient event. But is the the only way to say that is a transient event? Because if you are looking just at the map of the sky and if you are looking at the position. It's difficult because you're not expecting, for the moment, there is no source that you are expecting like uh, more than uh, uh, maybe a, a big statistic of events in the four year of the of observation that we have up to now. So the only, the, only, the only way to say that this is a transient source is just to have this correlation in time, in a short time, and this is for the big flare as Markarian 421 or PKS uh, 14K. Okay. Uh, a second question is regarding the galaxy center, yeah. which can be considered a point-like point -like source. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that there are some PAVs, neutrinos coming from... Yeah, there from is one, 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 only? one of these that is exactly can be related to the... It's a PAV, actually. It's, 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 a, tra it's, a, sorry, it's a shower event. So the, the, the angular resolution is about 16 degrees, something like this. So the people say, okay, it's a 16 degree, it's compatible with the center of the galaxy, but in 16 degree, uh, you can have a lot of stuff, no? So, yeah, actually, the, the I think the most, imp the, 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 the important step will be correlate the pevaton that is observed now uh, from Earth, from the center of the galaxy, mm -hmm. and to say, okay, uh, we can reach with the pevaton emission, the one events, because at the moment we are, in the most optimistic case, we have to 0 0.5 events in the in the four year observation. So say okay, the pevatron actually is not enough at the moment to 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 the, to, to see to account for this one event that is observed. At the moment. And is there any uh, suggestions about the, the source of this? Yeah, that's the uh, okay, PAV neutron. Uh, it, it should be you have a supernova remnant that is close to there is, but the supernova remnant you expect a cutoff in gamma rays, and uh, you cannot you are not observing this cutoff. The other one is the Sagittarius A, so the supermassive black hole. So probably this is the first case that we observe really the, the, the emission from the activation disk of the supermassive black hole. So probably this will be very interesting because at the time where we will see, okay, we will have a, a, a good spatially uh, containment of this emission in gamma ray. And when we will obtain a more statistic of neutrino, I think uh, uh, it will be interesting because probably it's the first and the most accurate <coughs> analysis we can do about uh, a creation disk of the black hole that is in the center of the galaxy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Last question. Can you comment a bit more about the uh, debate for the uh, Starburst galaxies? Yeah. yeah, the most debate is coming there. The people, when they do this, this uh, when they do this, this study, in this red line, you can see here this is this, this upper limit that for, for non BLAC sources. So the Starburst galaxy should be below this upper limit. So the people say, okay, uh, the Starburst galaxy cannot account for, you can see the, the blue points are the, the ice cube uh, spectral that are obtained from the ice cube analysis. So you have all these gaps. So the, the, the Starburst galaxy should be contained in this region. So the people say we, we cannot account for Starburst galaxy through the, 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 the observation of ice cubes. But there is another debate. For example, I was just in Dublin last, last week, two weeks ago, and with Aronian, we have a good, he have a very different point of view of this to say, no, okay, uh, actually here, the error bars of this region and the, the uncertainty of this region is not enough to say Starburst galaxy are not uh, the main candidate for extragalactic components. And so the, the, the good things for Starburst galaxy, I think, if we have now a good model for the diffuse emission of our galaxy, and we can, we can calculate how should be the density of Starburst galaxy, so we can apply this model for all the galaxies that are Starburst galaxy, and say we should be the density of the source that we need to account for the for this flux. I, I think this should be the, the ultimate uh, the ultimate analysis that we can do about Starburst galaxy. So most of people say, you know, for, okay, BLAX and the uh, flux spectrum radiophysics are the, the best candidate, but not the community, not all the community are uh, agree about this. There is a big debate. Okay, let's um, let's thank Antonio again. Tenemos after Paris, no se vayan.